This is wonderful. Yeah, but the ocean is next to the desert. And there's some cacti over here and just no vegetation at all there. And then the ocean next to it. Yeah, I wonder how that could be. Wow, look at the landscape. It's so pretty and so much broader. And then you have only rocks above and lots of vegetation at the bottom. Yeah, and a lot of vegetation because it's rainy here also. Yeah, does it rain more? Yeah. Okay. I wonder if the soils are different here because of the vegetation. The surface of the Earth is constantly in motion. This happens very slowly. We can only see snapshots in time. The two most important processes of the Earth's surface work against each other. On one hand, soil formation is driven from below, when rocks are lifted upwards by forces inside the Earth, and then, when close to the surface, broken down into soil by weathering. On the other hand, soil is removed from Earth's surface from above by erosion. Erosion occurs through flowing water, through wind or through glaciers, and simply because of gravity. Erosion is heavily influenced by the climate. The form of plants, animals and microorganisms, a green skin on Earth's surface. How does this biologic skin of the Earth change the effect of the two opposing processes? Is it even the most important factor? These questions require a completely new way of thinking. Does the bio-world form the geo-world? Or is the geo-world the basis for the bio-world? Alternatively, are the geo-world the rocks and soils, and the bio-world, the plants, animals and microbes, interdependent. We already know a lot about processes acting at the Earth's surface, but most studies fall within the traditional boundaries of individual scientific disciplines. Soil science deals with soil formation and the plant roots that grow in it. Geochemistry is concerned with chemical conversions at the Earth's surface. Microbiology investigates the microbial communities under the Earth's surface. Plant ecology investigates the relationships between climate and plant diversity. Geomorphology investigates how landscapes form and erode. Three scientists provide different perspectives. I am a geochemist. I deal with the chemistry of the Earth. And this is the Earth's surface. At the Earth's surface, rock is converted into weathered rock. And this forms soil. It's done with rain that contains acids. It's an abiogenic process, purely chemical. I am Michaela Dippold, soil ecologist from Göttingen University. My main interest is to understand how the biota drives the element cycles in ecosystems. There are two main interaction zones between the biota and the soil. The litter layer, where the elements 
from the plants enter the soil and the rhizosphere, the tiny little zone around the roots through which all nutrients plants need for growth need to be acquired. I'm a geologist. I investigate the equations for how processes deep within the earth build mountains and how climate through erosion shapes the topography we see today. Exploring the skin of the earth presents a big challenge. The processes active on the earth's surface take place over completely different periods of time. In science, these are called timescales. Hours for microbial proliferation by cell division. Days over which plants and animals sleep and wake. A few decades for tree growth. Tens of thousands of years for natural climate fluctuations. Hundreds of thousands of years for transforming rock into soil. Many millions of years for the movement of the Earth's plates. But what we see at the Earth's surface also depends on how long we look. If you let a plant grow, visible changes can be seen after only a few days. Biological research tends to think about the timescales plants grow over. On the other hand, landforms like mountains and valleys always seem to look the same. Geological research therefore thinks in much longer periods of time than biological research. These different timescales are a major hurdle for interdisciplinary research. The research project EarthShape wants to overcome this obstacle with joint geo and bio research. EarthShape investigates the influence of biological processes on the Earth's surface. It is a large international project led in Germany and located in the Chilean coastal mountains. In EarthShape, German and Chilean universities and research institutes work together. The scientists investigate how the activity of living organisms affects the Earth's surface and how, conversely, the composition of the subsoil influences the life sitting on it. What I wonder is, I mean, this is not the common landscape. There are no trees here, so how, how works that if there would be trees or grassland or shrubs? I think what we'd have to do is have a series of control experiments with different amounts of, of vegetation and, and, and climate, which we can do here in Chile. To figure out the influence of climates on plants and microorganisms, four locations in Chile with very different climates are compared with each other. The most obvious impact of climate can be seen in the vegetation density. The northernmost location, the Pandazucar National Park, is located in the driest desert on Earth, the Atacama Desert. Here scientists can explore a surface with virtually no plants. The Santa Gracia Reserve is a semi-arid area with only a few cacti and shrubs, but no trees. The more southern La Campana National Park has a Mediterranean climate with palm trees and considerable rainfall and dense vegetation. The southernmost location, Nahuelbuta National Park, is a rainforest with a lot of rainfall. Araucaria, an impressive tree that dates back to the Jurassic period, can be found here. In the EarthShape project, samples and field data are collected during fieldwork in the Chilean coastal mountains. The construction of weather stations, the installation of cameras for the permanent observation of soil change by digging animals. The
the measurement of rock strength. The construction of rainout shelters to simulate the effect of climate on plants. The determination of minerals in rocks. Recording soil properties in soil profiles. The investigation of the underlying rocks with geological drilling. In March 2019, the kickoff event of the second phase of the Earthshape project took place in Olmue in the Chilean coastal mountains. The project runs until 2022 and is coordinated by Todd Ehlers, University of Tübingen, and Friedhelm von Blankenburg, Geoforschungszentrum Potsdam. Staff from the Chilean National Park's CONAF were warmly welcomed. First, the 80 scientists that conducted research in the first phase of Earthshape exchanged their results. Among other things, topics include the geology of Chile, soil formation, plant species distribution and nutrient uptake in plants, how erosion works, simulation of the vegetation and climate with numeric models. The scientists then developed strategies for the future course of the project in group discussions. The doctoral students presented their research projects. An important goal of the project is to stimulate discussion beyond discipline boundaries. Here, the soil ecologist Michaela Dippold discusses with the geochemist Friedhelm von Blankenburg. So during weathering, solutes are released from minerals. They are present in solution, in pore solutions, and plants can access them. But plants can also really efficiently recycle nutrients from the vegetation to the soil and back into the vegetation. Okay, but isn't that soil layer continuously eroded and also dissolved by water so nutrients are being lost? Yes, but this is exactly the proportion of nutrients which needs to get reacquired from the depth. The soil ecologist Michaela Dippold also finds common ground with the geologist Todd Ehlers. I was thinking about this and, and we have models, climate models and tectonic models and we can combine these and we can understand how erosion occurs at the Earth's surface. But how do plants fit into that? Can plants have a massive effect on mm. erosion and weathering? So what we could do is have coupled models of the biosphere, atmosphere and geosphere and look at how these processes interact to form the Earth's surface. The spectacular views of their study site are particularly inspiring for discussion. In order to model these types of things, we need a way of, of knowing the, how you convert bedrock into loose material that you can move down slope. Are, are there ways of doing this? So yes, we have geochemical methods with which we measure exactly the rate at which the rock is converted into soil that then is available for transport with water. But in, in a landscape like this, we don't have any vegetation. Does, what if we're in a vegetated landscape? Does this work also there? Yes, so this would be a key experiment that one could do in this landscape is actually the rate at which this happens, geochemically different from the one in a landscape that is totally covered with trees. 30 doctoral students from all disciplines are working in Chile to establish new knowledge. Some of the questions are Where do plants take up nutrients from weathered rock? Hi, I'm a PhD student in isotope geochemistry and I assemble rock, regolith and plants and use isotopes to decipher states of weathering and ecosystem nutrition. Back in Germany, there are many steps to be taken. First, Ralf weighs the samples collected in Chile in an ultra-clean laboratory. Their isotope composition is measured using an isotope mass spectrometer. The isotope ratios are then evaluated as fingerprints of the origin of nutrients. 
Another question is how exactly do nutrients get from the soil into the plants? I'm a doctoral student in soil ecology. Here I'm studying roots and their associated mycorrhizal fungi, which supports the plant in their uptake of nutrients. In the laboratory, he looks at the samples from Chile under the microscope. He simulates carbon uptake to follow the path of carbon in the plant and in the soil. And he evaluates the different forms of carbon of the soil on a gas chromatograph. How exactly does the nutrient uptake from soil and rock work in different climate zones? A landscape with heavily weathered soils and hardly any pristine rock remaining is covered by a dense forest. There is heavy rainfall, so soil moisture, symbolized by the blue dots, is high. But where do the trees get their nutrients from when there are hardly any of the original rocks left? A fascinating cycle begins. Phosphorus, in red, is an important mineral nutrient found in rock and soil. Phosphorus is largely absorbed by fungal hyphae. These fine white fungal tissues are connected with the roots of many trees. Fungal hyphae help phosphorus get into the roots from where it migrates to the tree trunk and then to the leaves. But this process costs energy. The leaves absorb carbon through photosynthesis, some of which is delivered back to the roots. There, it is partly transferred to the fungal hyphae, which draw energy from it. Additional carbon is also released into the soil, where it accumulates over many years and turns the soil dark brown. The organic carbon accumulates in the soil. In autumn, the leaves fall and decompose into soil organic matter. This makes the soil even darker. In addition, the phosphorus contained in the leaves can be reabsorbed incredibly efficiently by the dense network of fungal hyphae and recycled again through the tree, released as leaf litter and taken up again and again. This is a recycling ecosystem. It draws much more mineral nutrients from the leaf litter than it does from the rock. In a dry area with little soil moisture, this is quite different. The only vegetation is shrubs and cacti that grows slowly and not very densely. Nevertheless, these plants also absorb their nutrients with roots and fungal hyphae. But since little litter is produced each year, not much organic soil material is formed which would supply fungal hyphae and vegetation with nutrients. This means the fungal hyphae have to find the nutrients deep in the rock. Since there is less vegetation, less carbon is also transferred to roots and fungal hyphae. The entire nutrient cycle is slower and nutrient fluxes are lower. This ecosystem is acquiring because it draws its mineral nutrients mainly from the rock. In the humid area, here on the left, there are not enough nutrients in the soil. The fast-growing ecosystem is sustained mainly by recycling. In the dry area, here on the right side, with sparse and slowly growing vegetation, the nutrients are mainly supplied by uptake from the rock. This is the fundamental difference between element cycles in ecosystems of different climate zones. Another question. How does the climate and vegetation in the different regions affect how landscapes look like and how fast they erode? Hi, I'm a doctorate student at the German Research Center of Geosciences in Potsdam. I just measured channel grain sizes and took a river sediment sample to estimate erosion rates. Using magnets, she removes the magnetic minerals from the sand samples in the laboratory so that only the mineral quartz remains.
She dissolves the sample in the laboratory with hydrofluoric acid, an acid strong enough that it can dissolve even the resistant mineral quartz. She measures so-called cosmogenic nuclides held within the dissolved quartz. These reveal the erosion rate of the river basin. With the erosion rates, she can explain the influence of vegetation on landscape development. These relationships can be evaluated mathematically with the help of a digital landscape model. How does climate affect plant diversity and the decomposition of their leaves? I'm a plant ecologist and I'm studying litter decomposition, which is the decomposition of leaves. Lisbeth van den Brink weighs the samples from the leaf litter to determine how quickly the leaves decompose over time. In this way, she can see how nutrients, such as phosphorus from plants, could be reabsorbed from the leaf litter. She then uses statistical methods to determine the influence of climate on plant cycles. So how do we combine all the findings of the landscapes with data of their vegetation? One possibility is by using computer simulations. Tectonic forces push up the surface and lift it to higher and higher elevations. Earth's surface represents a delicate balance between tectonic and climatic forces, which through erosion removes material and lowers the surface. These models are based on what we think are the best mathematical relationships to explain how different processes work on this landscape. For example, hill slope processes convert bedrock into soil, which then moves downslope to rivers. Rivers take this sediment from the hill slopes and flush them downstream if there is enough water. One of the biggest questions facing geoscientists today is how different would this landscape look if vegetation were on it. In this computer model, we can see how the addition of dense vegetation to the Earth's surface would influence the landscape development. To grow dense vegetation, we need large amounts of rainfall. Plants influence how the rivers erode into the landscape and how sediment makes it to the rivers. They intercept rainfall, which limits the water's ability to erode Earth's surface. And because of their protective effect on the mountain slopes, the plants concentrate water runoff and erosion into large, deep valleys. However, as uplift continues, the mountains between the valleys rise higher and higher. If we zoom into one catchment, we see that vegetation obstructs the flow of water and focuses it in channels. We can also see the deep weathering of rock by water and plant roots. This landscape is very similar to what we see in Parque Nacional Nahuel Buta in south central Chile. This next computer model shows how different the land surface looks with very little precipitation and thus little vegetation on top of it. The sparse vegetation is unable to protect the surface from erosion, so even though there is less rainfall, it is easier for it to erode the hill slopes. Because of the low water flow, only small river valleys form. The eroded sediment is transported into a dense drainage network of many small rivers. Due to a lack of water, a lot of sediment remains in the valleys. 
drought and reduced plant cover also lead to less weathering and thinner soils. This example of an arid landscape with very little vegetation is similar to what we see in northern Chile, in the Parque Nacional Pandazucar. Have the Earthshape scientists now taken a step forward in exploring the interdependencies between the geo-world and the bio-world? Let's once again ask Friedhelm von Blankenborg, the geochemist, Michaela Dippold, the soil ecologist, and Todd Ehlers, the geologist. So after sampling plant material, rock material, soils, and measuring geochemical fluxes and isotopic ratios, we can now say whether plants get their mineral nutrients from rock and from what depth or whether they are released by processes where plants have no involvement. And this is a big step forward in the question whether the biology or the geology dries the Earth's surface. We can quantify enzyme activity and root exudation in the rhizosphere, the small zone around the root where the bio and the geosphere interact. With this we can quantify the energy investment of the vegetation actively shaping the Earth's surface. From our coupled models of the biosphere, geosphere and atmosphere, what we've learned is that the type of plants that are present and the number of plants can make a big difference for the topography that we see today. However, this isn't always the case and there are situations when geologic processes or atmospheric processes can be more important and that's what we're working on understanding more of now. Are we at the end of our story? Do we now know what happens when life meets rocks? Not quite yet. What our experts say is that although they can quantify dependencies, these dependencies always run in both directions, from life to rocks and from rocks to life. It is based on a fundamental property of coupled natural systems feedback. So under equilibrium conditions we have here an ecosystem. Well, now let's assume we have an uplift here. We uplift this rock and as a result we have lots of erosion. Now they discuss how short biological and long geological processes intertwine. The interaction results in a classic negative feedback. Two parts of a system are in a state of equilibrium with each other. An outside disturbance of the upper partner throws the entire system out of balance. The lower partner acts against this perturbation and the system returns to its original state. We can imagine this as a dance. We see the rock world in grey and living world in green. Both dance harmoniously in a stable balance. A disturbance brings the two out of beautiful harmony. Only slowly does green life bring the grey rocky world and its landscape back into their original balance. All of a sudden, another disturbance occurs, much bigger than the previous. This time, the rock world pulls the living world into balance, but the balance is a different one. The state of the system has changed. This is how feedback works in natural systems. The Earth system constantly stabilizes itself through numerous such feedbacks. 
One such feedback is rock weathering, in which biology plays a role. By using carbonic acid, rock weathering constantly consumes CO2 from the atmosphere, albeit very slowly. Thus, rock weathering balances the release of new CO2 from volcanoes. Since CO2 warms the Earth's atmosphere, this feedback has stabilized Earth's climate for many millions of years. Another feedback comes from the plants of the Earth that stabilize the CO2 of the atmosphere and thus the Earth's climate much faster. If the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere increases, more plants grow through faster photosynthesis. The CO2 in the atmosphere falls again. But today, humans are adding large amounts of additional CO2 to the atmosphere. It throws the system out of balance, and neither the vegetation nor the rock weathering of the Earth can retain balance again quickly enough. The result is global warming, with major consequences for the planet's surface and humankind. With their research on the coupled processes within this fragile zone, where life meets rock, the members of the Earthshape project aim at evaluating the sensitivity of this system to perturbations. In doing so, they allow mankind to assess the impact of the climate change induced today, and what should be done to preferably prevent this major perturbation, which will affect our livelihood in ways that are hard to imagine.